Thanks, Libby, very much. Good morning, everybody. Good to, good to see you. Thanks, Ben. Let's pray again uh, together now. Our Father, we thank you for speaking to us. We thank you for bringing us here today uh, to hear from you. And we pray that your spirit would be at work among, among us, leading us and guiding us. For your name's sake. Amen. So, friends, we have a sweet word of God today. Um, the psalmist uh, said in the Psalms, taste and see that the Lord is good. And when the psalmist said that, I think this is the kind of thing he might have dreamt of, this kind of word. If we were to try to consume, to taste, to eat up all the goodness of this passage, we'd be sat at the table feasting for day after day after day. Let's have our Bibles open now. Let's get knife and fork in hand and we'll see what the Lord will give us to eat. We've got time in our missional communities, if you're part of that, through the week to eat a bit more. Okay. Have a look at Romans 8, verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. In other words, brothers and sisters, we're debtors. So is that surprising to hear that we're debtors and that this might be tasty and good? We're debtors. If I had to sum up the whole passage which we're thinking about today, I'd put it like this. Never condemned, so forever indebted. Never condemned by God, so forever indebted to God. Because we're free from ever being condemned, because of Christ, we owe everything, everything by the Spirit to our Father God forever. Never condemned, so forever indebted. We're going to spend some time thinking practically about being forever indebted and enjoying that sweet taste as we, as we finish today. But I'm going to go to the main course first, never condemned. We'll spend a good amount of time thinking about that and then a good amount on forever indebted. So, let's see, hopefully we'll come to the passage now. Here we go, never condemned. Now do you remember the voice of the sinner? In fact, Ben was talking about it earlier today. The voice of the sinner at the end of the previous chapter. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Now, you may think this is a Christian continuing in the struggle with sin. That's what I think about chapter 7. You might think it's the struggle of a non-Christian prior to conversion. In either case, it's a sinner speaking. And for sinners like us, like you, like me, Romans 8 is wonderful, wonderful news. Paul is looking back over the whole sweep of what he's been telling the Roman Christians. There's wonderful news in Romans chapter 4 and chapter 5 about justification by faith, of being counted righteous, not because of our works, not because of the things we do, but because of faith in Jesus. And chapter 6 is celebration, if you were here a couple of Sundays ago, that we are baptised into Christ Jesus, into his death, and now we are alive in the risen Christ. And that brings us now to this beautiful, sweet and wonderful truth in Romans 8. A golden truth which can carry us through our darkest times, the times when we are really struggling, when we're feeling overwhelmed, perhaps by daily life, perhaps by our sins, perhaps by other people's judgment of us. This can carry us through. And here's that sweet golden, wonderful thought. It is this, that Christ himself is risen bodily from the dead and he is inviting us into his life, to be in him. What does in mean? Those who put their faith in Christ are in him, in his body, in his body. That's the body, the body of Jesus which has died and now is risen. So we, if we're in his body, in him, 
we have died in Christ and risen in Christ. And Ben was reminding about that, uh, us about that earlier. We've died in Christ, we're risen in Christ, and that's where we now get to, when we get to verse 1 of chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through the risen Christ, through Christ Jesus, the risen Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now that law of sin and death, if you remember, that, that kept the sinner in Romans 7 in a kind of forever cycle, a loop of being told what to do and what not to do, wanting to do what's right and then doing what was wrong. Evil is right there beside me, said Paul. It's like a companion, always there, wearing away at us, taking us off course. Evil's right there beside me. And so he cries out, who can rescue me from the body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord, by which he means the risen Jesus Christ. So we are in the risen Christ, in his body. How does that get us out of this loop, this forever loop of law and death and sin? How is the sinner saved? How is never condemned true in our life? Now to really get into this, we've got to think about how bad our situation is without Christ. So think of a trapdoor, a trapdoor which is shut and closed. And think of someone in the darkness underneath that trapdoor who tries to open that trapdoor by pulling hard down on a rope which is hanging beneath it. Now what that person can't see, what that person can't know, is that the trapdoor opens the other way. And every time they pull on it, it gets more and more wedged down. That is an image of the law, trying to escape from being under the law and escape from death by doing what the law requires is going to make you more and more trapped. You'll be condemned under the law, under the trap door. That's what it's like to be under the law. So our way of being human, our sinful nature, have a look there in verse 3. Our way of being human, our sinful nature, meant that the law was so weakened that we were stuck in sin. However hard we tried, we brought down on ourselves more sin, more judgment. And God's good law, God's law is good, but it was powerless, powerless to help us because it was weakened by our sin. So we're stuck underneath it and condemned. But then, wonderfully, we see, but God. God in the, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Jesus came as a human just like us, and Christ's way of being human wasn't at all weakened by sin, and so he could be a sin offering, that perfect sacrifice for our sin, taking our place, a sacrifice instead of us. And this is wonderful news. Think again about that trap door. Jesus has come into the darkness, into the place where we were stuck, into our condemnation, and then by becoming an offering on the cross, he takes that condemnation which we deserve into himself, upon himself. God condemns sin in the flesh of Jesus, in his body, as he became sin for us. He took the judgment of God into his own body. This is astonishing if you think about it, if you know anything about Jesus. He is a great lover. He is a kind and wonderful person. He fully kept all the requirements of the law. And if you were here for Romans 7 last week, we'll know that the law is holy and righteous and good. And this one then, Jesus, Jesus who is holy and righteous and good, he receives condemnation for sin. And wonderfully, since all the condemnation was taken into him, all the condemnation, then there's no condemnation left for us if we trust in him, in his mission and in his plan, in his Father's plan. So we can be forgiven for all our sins and so 
we are never condemned. Never condemned to receive that death, the wages which are owed to sin, if you can remember back to Romans 6 a couple of weeks ago. Think about it this way. Death is the debt which sin exacts. Death is the debt which sin exacts. But if we're in Christ, Christ's body shields us from that death, from that condemnation which we deserve. We're in the body of Christ. Christ's body receives the condemnation into it, but we are shielded within his body. If we're baptised into Christ's death, we are in him, all the condemnation falls on him. We're safely inside, protected by his death. Have you ever heard those um, news stories? We hear it quite a lot these days, that someone has done something inexcusable, unforgivable. It's often said about politicians. It's often said about people who've uh, done terrible things. Now this world and our lives is full of real wickedness. Things we have done, things other people have done to us. This world is full of real wickedness. C.S. Lewis said, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in us, in you. This is the reality. We were inexcusable, but God has been so kind to us. It calls us to live a way of forgiveness too. But that's uh, another story for another day. Amazingly, God does more than forgive us. So we'll move on a bit in the passage now. End of verse 3. God condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. Now, some people think this is about us doing what the law requires. I don't think so. Paul will get to our obligation to us being debtors, but we haven't got there yet, I don't think, in his argument. What I think he's saying is the logical next step, that if Christ is holy and righteous and good, if he has kept the law, and if we are in him, in his body, then of course the righteous requirements of the law has been fully met in us, not by us, but in us, met by Christ, the one who is holy and righteous and good, in whom we now live according to the Spirit, as it says at the end of verse 4. The Spirit, if you remember, has set us free from the demands of the law. Now we can miss this if we don't get this golden truth which was there in what Ben was teaching us in the Bible, bite size. The glory of the resurrection of Christ and what it means to be in him. Think about it again. Christ came to share in our darkness, to take our condemnation in his body by dying for us, to rescue us from the law. He came under that trapdoor with us. But all that's going to be no good at all to us if Christ is not risen from the dead. It's going to help us not at all if Christ isn't risen from the dead. But Christ is risen from the dead. He is now alive. The only way that Christ can be any good to us is if he is alive and we are alive in him. Because that's the only way that the righteousness of God can come to us. Back at the end of Romans 4, Romans 4, 25, it says... Christ was handed over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. The resurrection really matters for our justification. If we go back to verse 1 there, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life. The Spirit who gives life. That's the core of what Paul's trying to communicate to us. The Spirit gives life. Now, to, know, to understand what that means, we've got to skip on a little bit. He comes back to the same thought again in verse 10. If you've got your Bibles open, you'll see it there, a bit, a, a bit, a bit lower down. But here it is. 
if Christ is in you, the same idea, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Now remember, we were pulling down on that trapdoor. We were pulling down, trapping ourselves under the law. And in these words, Paul is, as it were, hammering against that trapdoor. He's hammering this point home. He's hammering to make sure that trapdoor opens above us. We're in Christ, yeah? Christ is also in us. The righteous requirements of the law are fully met in us because Christ, who is perfectly righteous, is in us. But how does that happen? How does that come to us? The Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Because of God's righteous act of condemning our unrighteousness in Jesus' flesh, God's righteous act in saving you and saying yes to to Jesus' righteous life in the resurrection, God says yes to what is righteous, no to what is unrighteous. Because of that, the Spirit gives life. Because we are now in Christ, Christ is in us, forgiven for our sins, clothed in Christ's righteousness, all the requirements of the law met in us. We're never condemned. God now says yes to us because he said yes to Jesus. And now we are those to whom the Spirit gives life. That's what it means, the slightly strange saying in verse 10. The Spirit gives life because God has been righteous, because God has saved us in the way he said he would. And that means if we go back to verse 4, when it talks, verse 4 there, when it talks of those who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, right at the end, that's according to the Spirit's way of making us alive in Christ. So there's a lot going on there. But the core thing is that because we are made righteous in Christ, the Spirit gives life. Now what does that mean, the Spirit gives us life? Have a look here. This is what it means. The Spirit gives us Christ's life. Christ's life blows the trapdoor open. It blasts it off its hinges. I couldn't find one with a trapdoor blown off. But that's the basic idea. It's like a mighty earthquake. Remember that bit in Matthew's Gospel where the tombs break open, people start walking around? It's like that. It's like when the curtain in the temple in Mark's Gospel is ripped in two, the stone rolled away from Jesus' tomb. Unstoppable, untamable, powerful, free. That's the Spirit giving life. And this is the Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So that even though death still has a grip on our old flesh, and I've gone over 40, so I'm feeling a bit more of a grip myself, feeling a bit less sturdy than I was. The spirit, that death still has a grip on our old flesh, the spirit will give life. If you go to, to verse 11, is that up there? No, we'll go back to that. Verse 11, if you can find that. In your, in, your, in your Bible. The Spirit will give life. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. So, with the door wide open, we can come out of the tomb, out from under that trapdoor, and we come blinking into the glorious light of a new day, a day that God has made for us and has filled us with a, with a Spirit, to live in. We're never condemned, we're free. And therefore, this is the point that Paul's been building up to, pretty much the whole of Romans, to this point, Romans 8, verse 12. Therefore, Paul says, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. Literally in the Greek, we are debtors. That's the climax that Paul's been building up to, this extraordinary celebration, God's righteousness, Christ, the Spirit, no condemnation, the end of the law, no longer trapped under the power of sin and death. Having said all that, Paul's next thought is, we have an obligation. We're debtors. It's surprising in a way. Now, um, Alan Redpath, he was a great um, Edinburgh-based preacher, and he really wanted the people he loved and cared for, to live free in the power of the Spirit, to learn to press into the life that God had uh, given them. 
He was on a train, and as he was going along in the train, this thought dropped into his head as he was listening to the train on the tracks. Click, clack, click it, clack, click, clack, click it, clack. And what he heard was this, click, clack, click it, clack, saved soul, wasted life. Click, clack, click it, clack, saved soul, wasted life. A wasted life, a life which is not led by the Spirit, not pressing into the things of the Spirit. Why did God go to all the trouble to give us his Son? It was to bring us out from under the law so that the righteousness of Christ could be us, so that we could be saved from the grip of death on our throat. Yes, all that. But that's not the end of the story. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. I wonder if there's someone who has loved you in such a way, in your life, that your heart is just always open to them. But when you think of them, you're always wanting to bring them pleasure, bring them joy. It could be someone who raised you as a kid. It could be your mum or your dad, an auntie or uncle, maybe a teacher, um, a godparent maybe, who's invested in your life. Whatever mess you're in, they've kept on loving you. They've kept on caring for, for you, even when you've turned against them. Is there someone like that in your life? It could be someone you met as an adult, a friend, a mentor, or a pastor. Someone who's kept on with you. And if there is someone like that, how do you feel about them? How do you feel about them? I feel indebted, deeply indebted. But it's not like a debt you can count up. I don't know. Um, my mum or dad changed my nappy uh, for two years. So I'm going to call them twice a week. That's not the kind of debt which makes sense here. It's like being under the law again. It's like counting up what you owe. We're talking about a debt of love which doesn't fit a formula. Now, perhaps there's no one like that in your life. Someone to whom you feel really indebted. And that wouldn't be surprising, sadly. The world's a messy place. For some of us, there's nobody who has loved us anything like that. But for all Christians... Paul says, there is God. God raised us to be his children. God raised us from the dead. God loved us when we could not love him, when we were pulling down hard on the very door he wanted to open us, open to us. God raised us through his son by the spirit who gives life, the spirit of God who makes us children of God. And if that's us, brothers and sisters, we're debtors. We've got an obligation not to the flesh, though, not to go back into that darkness under the trapdoor. Do you know that place, that place of darkness under the trapdoor? There's no debt there. We don't want to go back there. The debt is to the Spirit who has led us into freedom because those who are led by the Spirit are children of God, forever indebted. So... We owe everything to Jesus' Father, our Abba Father, our Daddy God. We're never going to be condemned by him. We're never going to be condemned by him. So we're forever indebted to live by his Spirit, in the freedom of his love. Can you think of all those stupid, petty, pointless sins that we've committed in our lives? All those horrific big ones, too. I've got plenty. God loves us already. God loves us so much, he's never going to condemn us. So we're forever indebted to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We owe God everything. But when I say we owe everything, it might sound like going back towards the trapdoor again. Like the trapdoor's being closed in on us again. Like, it, like it's all on us again. No, because when we say we as Christians, we don't just mean us. We mean us in Christ by the Spirit. And that's what Paul wants us, unto, uh, wants us to understand next. If you have a look here 
at um, verse 5. Can you see that? It's, it's slightly uh, bigger in the type there. Verse 5. Those who live in accordance with the Spirit had their minds set on what the Spirit desires. It's set by the Spirit. Because, verse 6, the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Verse 9. If you're in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. So yes, we're debtors. Yes, we're called to a new way of life, but we're not alone. Our desires are now set by the Spirit. We're under the government. We're under the realm, the kingdom of the Spirit. So what does it mean to be led by the Spirit, to be governed, to be a debtor? Paul says in verse 13, there we go, verse 13. I'll uh, go back a bit first. Can you see there, verse 13? Forgive me, I can't even see it. It's not there yet. The, the, verse 13. If by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The misdeeds of the body. That's a plural word, misdeeds. There's more than one. And all of us who are sinners know that we, there are many ways that we sin. All the ways that take us back under the trap door. But what Paul is saying is that by the Spirit, and by prayer, and by our life together as a church, misdeeds can be put to death. Put it positively, though, how can we live? How will we live positively? We can talk about the old things which need to be done away with, but we also now need to think about the positive debt that we owe to God. And that's where we get to what I've got here. So what are the kinds of things that Paul might have in mind when he talks about us being debtors, about living to please God? Fortunately, we don't have to guess because there's loads in Romans 9 to 11 and Romans 12 to 14, which Paul tells us is the new life by the Spirit. The first one there, saying no to anti-Gentile or or anti-Jewish feeling. That's, broadly speaking, chapters 9 to 11. And then the long list following down there, the things that Paul's talking about in 12 to 14. Contributing to the needs of the saints, extending hospitality to strangers, Blessing those who persecute you, not cursing them. And you can read on down. The last two may be more surprising. Life by the Spirit, um, giving the Lord his debt, means being subject to governing authorities, paying taxes, and then refusing to cause others to stumble by insisting on our rights. Those are the kind of things which life in the Spirit and living out our our debt to God mean. So, the invitation from today is to avoid a wasted life. What will it mean for you, for us, as a church, with the Spirit, to put to death the misdeeds of the body, to live to please God? Let's think for a moment. What are the misdeeds of your body? What are the misdeeds of our body as a church? What are those missteps which would take us back, falling through the trapdoor and into sin? We need to put to death those misdeeds, not be overcome by evil, and replace misdeeds with good deeds by the Spirit. So just coming to an end now, as a reminder, if we're going to do this, we're going to live by the Spirit, we're not going to do it as wage earners. Romans 4 and Romans 6 taught us that what we're really owed for our sin is death. We don't do it as slaves to the law. The Spirit frees us from the law of sin and death. We never go back under that trapdoor. We do it because we are led by the Spirit, as children of the living God. The Spirit we received doesn't make us slaves. We call out, Abba, Father. We love to please our Father, and then we become heirs, like Jesus, of a hope of the of, of life to come. Like Jesus, we also want to help others come out from under the trapdoor to join the family, and unless they do, Back in verse 8, they can't please God. But if they do, then they, like us, we are Christians, can be never condemned and so forever indebted. And so for us, think back to that click, clack, click it, clack. It won't be saved soul, wasted life. It will be saved soul, spirit-led life. Saved soul, indebted life. Saved soul, God-pleasing life. Never condemned forever indebted.
And all this, if you see down at the end of verse 17, will mean that it's saved soul, suffering life. And, and it will mean saved soul, glorious life. That's our vocation as Christians. That's our call. Like Jesus, suffering first, glory later. But that's the theme for next week. For now, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that we are never condemned because of Christ. And so we're forever indebted to you, our Abba Father, our Daddy God. And we pray that the life of the Spirit would work in us and through us and among us to lead us into your way. That we would be those people who live the life indebted to you. Live a life of love, blessing those around us, not cursing. And do all the things which will bring glory to your name. Help us, we pray, because we're sinners. Save us from ever going back into that trapdoor and lead us in the new life of the Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much, Josh. Brilliant. We're going to sing our final song.